morning yakker this morning. <laughs> I'll read us our scripture and then you're going to get your instructions. The smith with tongs both wor works the coals and fashions with a hammer and works with the strength of his arms. He's hungry, his strength fails, he drinks no water and is faint. Oh, I've been there, done that. The carpenter stretched out his rule and marked it with a line. He fitted it with planes and marked it out with the compass and made the after figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. He hewed him down cedars and he takes the cypress and the oak which he strengthens for himself among the trees of the forest. He planted an ash, and the rain did nourish it. Then shall it be that for man to burn, for he takes it to warm himself. Yea, he kindled it, and he baked his bread. Yea, he made, maketh a god, and worshipped it. He made a graven image, and falls down thereto. He burned part of it in the fire. With part thereof he ate flesh, and roasted roast, and is satisfied, yea, he warmed himself, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They had not known nor understood. He had shut his eyes, and they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considered his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say. I have burned part of the, in the fire, Yea, also I have baked bread upon coals, therefore I have roasted flesh and eaten it. I shall make residue thereof an abomination. Shall I fall down to the stalk of a tree? He feeds on ashes. He deceives the heart, turning him aside. He cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Okay, now you've had it. Good morning. Welcome, and if you're new, please let us know, and the rest of you, if you see somebody you haven't seen before, reach out and say hello. Welcome them. We need them, and they need us. So, John and I have something for you. Our Father, who art in heaven. Yes. Don't interrupt me, I'm praying. But you called me. Called you? No, I didn't call you, our Father who art in heaven. There, you did it again. Did what? Called me. You said, our Father, which art in heaven. Well, here I am. What's on your mind? But I didn't mean anything by it. I was, you know, just saying my prayers for the day. I always say the Lord's Prayer. It makes me feel good, kind of like fulfilling the day. Well, all right. Go on. Okay. Hallowed be thy name. Hold it right there. What do you mean by that? By what? By hallowed be thy name. It means, it means... Good grief, I don't know what it means. How in the world should I know? It's just part of the prayer. By the way, what does it mean? It means honored, holy, wonderful. Oh, that makes sense. I never thought about hollow, what hallowed meant before. Thanks. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Do you mean that? Sure, why not? Well, what are you doing about it? Doing? Why, nothing, I guess. I just think it would be kind of neat if you got control of everything down here, like you have up there. We're kind of in a mess down here, you know. Yes, I know. But have I got control over you? Well, I, I, I go to church. That isn't what I asked you. What about your bad temper? You've really got a problem there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there's the way that you spend your money all on yourself. And what about the kind of books you read? Now hold it just a minute. Stop picking on me. I'm just as good as some of the rest of the people at church. Well, excuse me. I thought you were praying for my will to be done. 
If that is to happen, it will have to start with the ones who are praying for it, like you, for example. Oh, all right, I guess I do have some hang-ups. Now that you mention it, I could probably name some others. So could I. Ugh. I haven't thought about it much until now, but I really would like to cut out some of those things. I would like to, you know, be really free. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. We'll work together, you and me. I'm proud of you. Look, Lord, if you don't mind, I need to finish up here. Let's take this. Uh, it's taking a lot longer than it usually does. Give us this day our daily bread. You need to cut out the bread. You're overweight as it is. Hey, hey, wait a minute. What is this? Here I was doing my religious duty, and all of a sudden you break in and remind me of my, all of my hang-ups. Well, prayer is a dangerous thing. You just might get what you asked for. Remember, you call me, and here I am. It's too late now to stop. Keep praying. Go on. I'm scared, too. Scared of what? I know what you'll say. Try me. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What about Anne? See, I knew it. I knew you'd bring her up. Why, Lord, she told lies about me and spread stories. She never paid back the money she owes me. I swore I'd get even with her. But your prayer. What about your prayer? I didn't mean it. Well, at least you're honest. But it's quite a load carrying around all that bitterness and resentment, isn't it? Yes, I feel better as soon as I get even with her. Boy, have I got some plans for her. She'll wish she'd never been born. No, you won't feel any better. You'll feel worse. Revenge is not sweet. You know how unhappy you are. Well, I can change that. You can do that? Forgive Anne. Then I will forgive you. And the hate and sin will be Anne's problem, not yours. You will have settled the problem as far as I am concerned. Oh, you know, you were right. You always are. And more than I want revenge, I want to be right with you. All right, all right, I forgive her. There, now, wonderful. How do you feel? Mm, well, not bad, not bad at all. In fact, I feel pretty good. You know, I don't think I'll go to bed uptight tonight. I haven't been getting much rest, you know. Well, but you, you're not finished with your prayer, are you? Go on. Oh, all right. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Good, good. Just don't put yourself in a place where you can be tempted. What do you mean by that? You know what I mean. Yeah, I know. All right, go ahead. Finish your prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you know what would bring me glory? What would really make me happy? No, but I'd like to know. I want to please you now. I've really made a mess of things. I want to truly follow you. I can see how great that would be. So tell me, how do I make you happy? You just did. Amen. Amen. That was awesome, and so was the prelude. I loved it. Let's continue with singing. Please stand with me. To God be the glory.
now I know whom I have believed. 213. I'm going to invite uh, Paul to come forward. We have a special presentation today uh, from Michigan A- Mission Aviation Fellowship. Um, this is a wonderful ministry. I don't know, you're familiar with it. I know you've heard about it. They are uh, a, a local uh, entity with a global reach. They, uh, they do fantastic work. Paul's going to tell us about it. Um, but uh, as you hear what he has to say, I want you to have... Just open hearts uh, for support for this for this ministry. So I'll invite Paul to come forward and share with us. Thanks, mm-hmm. Good morning. Now I know some of you have come up and said uh, that you are supporters of MAF, and we really appreciate that. Um, our ministry is located here at Nampa Airport. But we are, like John said, a worldwide ministry. We do, uh, I like to talk about what we do, where we go, and why we do it. And uh, what we do is we minister to people in remote places around the world with airplanes, using aviation to serve them however we can do that. Um, We do medical evacuations. We help women having trouble with birth. We've had babies born in our airplanes. 
you cannot believe how many kids in Indonesia are named after pilots. Um, it happens, and we also are committed to when people pass away and the villages want their people back, we bring them back to them. Um, that's a little quieter flight, but it's still a blessing for us to do. Um, at Nampa Airport is where our, our worldwide headquarters for, for MAF US is there. And I invite you to come out and take a tour if you haven't done that. Um, the facility, we keep growing, which is uh, wonderful because we need to. But uh, people are really surprised. I do tours also, and so does Gil. And when we finish our tours, people say, I had no idea. That's, I hear that more than anything else. I had no idea this is what you do and how, how involved your facility is. So I invite you to do that. But I'd, what I'd like to do right now is show a little video, and then we'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. Go ahead. Do you see it? Most people just see an airplane. But to us, we see something else. We see food in the hands of the hungry. We see someone holding a Bible for the very first time. We see a way to go where there is no road. Yes, this is an airplane. But this is also someone's only chance to receive the operation they need. This is access to medical care and education. This is an answer to someone's deepest prayer. Over mountains, over deserts, over dense jungles, where others see a barrier, we see a way forward. This is much more than just an airplane. This is a bridge of possibility, a path for other nonprofits to go where they could not go, delivering help, hope, and healing. A farmer now has the livestock he needs. A doctor now has the equipment she requires. A village now has clean water for a lifetime. A family now knows the name of Jesus. From the Congo to Indonesia to restricted access nations, there are even more lives and an even greater impact that we can make. We are not just flying an airplane. We are flying for life. Do you see it? One picture is worth a thousand words and one video is worth probably 5,000. So that gives you an idea of what we do every day around the world. Um, every 12 minutes or so, there's an Air, MAF aircraft taking off or landing somewhere in the world 24 hours a day. So we're busy. But uh, that busyness is a blessing because I'll just read you this. I got this the other day. Um, a few months ago, MAF pilot Mike Brown flew to a medical evacuation in a Dem village in Papua, Indonesia. He flew out a woman, Elimana, who was having complications after giving birth. Helping her get to the help she needed is one of the things we are privileged to be able to do here, Mike said. But what struck Mike the most was, was when one of the new Dem believers stepped forward to pray for El Lima when, and her family before she left. This is a tribe that just heard the gospel for the first time less than two years ago. Mike said, I love how the gospel transforms lives. So we all know that, how the gospel transforms lives, but that's what we try and help to do around the world. You know, not just here. I mean, there is mission field here in Nampa, as there is in Idaho and the United States, but we serve around the world bringing help, hope, and healing to people who need it people who may never hear the gospel if we aren't there helping. Uh, we don't do Bible translations ourselves, but we deliver them. Uh, we have a, on the tour at the headquarters, we have a table that has about 30 Bibles in it, all in different languages, and I have people try and read it, and they can't. But each of those Bibles we've contributed somehow 
not in the translation itself, but either delivering them or helping the Bible translators, supplying them with what they need, bringing them in and out of the country where they're working. Some translations take 10 or 15 years to do. So, but we help. That's what we do, help, hope, and healing. We do it with airplanes. Um, and why do we do it? Because we want to share Jesus' love with people around the world. That's what we do. And out on the table there, you'll see this fact sheet. And it has a few interesting things in it. Um, we use 382 airstrips and water sites in, for landing and takeoff around the world. Uh, we have a, currently a presence in 12 countries. That kind of goes up and down depending on the political situation in the country. But right now we're strong in 12 countries in, and two what we call restricted access locations. So ask me about that later, I'll tell you about it. Um, in 2023, we delivered 4,927,925 pounds of cargo. Okay, that means our planes carried the equivalent of 98,599 50-pound suitcases. We have 171 missionary families serving overseas and at U.S. headquarters. And last year, MAF partnered with 271 different organizations around the world bringing help, hope, and healing for people around the world. So that's what we do. I know some of you support us, and we really, really appreciate it. The best way that you can support us is with prayer. We need prayer. I wear this so that it reminds me to pray. You can grab one of these off the table, too. Um, but, and if God puts it on your heart, like John said earlier, to, to give and donate, we can take that, too. But you can also come out to headquarters and volunteer. We have people that... They come out once a week, you know. We have people that come out and iron tablecloths for some of the events that we do. But we, ha we also have, uh, I'm an advocate, so is Gil, and uh, we do things like this to promote the ministry. So um, thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, there was one more thing I was going to say, but I'm 73 years old. What do I know? So, anyway, God bless you guys. Thanks. Okay, you had your lecture for the day. Now it's time to pay up. <laughs> Only later. I will have prayer when you get done. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you not only to worship you, but with thankful hearts and minds for you being you. We're so blessed that you are you. Your loving care, your guiding hands, for your forgiveness when we goof and we do. We come to you with thanksgiving for the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Like to invite the kids to come forward. Hi, Nancy. Good morning. So, do you guys know who my son is, my kid? Who's he? Tell me his name. Do you know his name? Cyrus. Do you see him? He's not in here, right? That means I can talk about him because he's not here. Because he went to his graduation. Not yet. His graduation is this afternoon. Yes, he is graduating from high school. That's a long ways in your future, isn't it? How many years before you guys graduate from high school? You got him counted out. How long? There's 12 grades. Eight more years. Does that feel like forever? Yeah. <laughs> How about you? You probably have 12 more years. You got a ways to go yet. It seems like it's a long ways. And you know what we did? We took pictures of him the first day of school, like on every year when he'd have his book bag on and he'd go to school. And so we have this, this collection of pictures of him every year as he went off to school. I didn't know if it was ever going to happen either. Okay. It takes a lot. But you know what? He did a lot. And I'm really thankful for it. And we get to celebrate that this afternoon. Now, I know that you guys are also going to do a lot in your life. You are going to have amazing stories to tell. You're going to experience wonderful things. And maybe some things that are kind of hard, too. Have you already experienced wonderful things? Have you experienced some things that are kind of hard? Yep. Because that's life. And here's something special. Cyrus got through all of his stuff because he had a family around him, people that cared about him and would help him do things. But more importantly, God was with him. Jesus walked through all of the different things that Cyrus went through, and now we get to celebrate something. Jesus is going to be there with you, helping you through all the things that you need to do in your life, celebrating the wonderful things and helping you get through the tough stuff too. You're never alone when you're with Jesus. And you know what? With Jesus, you guys are going to accomplish some amazing things. I have lots of faith that that's going to happen. I know that you guys are going to do awesome stuff. Do you guys feel like it? Really? Kind of? <laughs> you will. Trust me, you will. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful that we get to celebrate milestones, but we know that uh, the accumulation of all those wonderful stories that we tell sometimes takes a lot. It takes years of, of work and some joy and some difficulty. But Lord, we could never accomplish anything without you. And so we thank you for being with us all the time, equipping us, guiding us, and teaching us. And Lord, we just pray that we would have open hearts and open ears so that we might follow you more faithfully and accomplish the great things that you have in store for us. I pray that for each one of these kids. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. Are you awake? Isn't it amazing to look down at those little kids and just imagine all the possibilities for the work that they're going to do. It's kind of like overwhelming. I have a grandson. We have a grandson that's graduating Tuesday, and we have great hopes for him as well. Please stand. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's grace, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace, my gracious Yes. 
so much potential. But you know what? There's potential in us too. We are not done with our race, and so we will keep on doing what God wants us to do. I'm going to invite you today to turn to Acts chapter 19 for our message. The scripture will come from that 19th chapter. Just a short section of story uh, from this. And remember where we are. Paul is... Uh, been in, in Achaia, in Corinth. He's traveled over the Aegean. He's now in, in Asia Minor there in, in Ephesus. So I want to begin in the 23rd verse. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. This is the way of Jesus Luke is talking about. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade, and he said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. You also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are no gods. And there is a danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned and that she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. Back in 1863 before anyone's time here. Back in 1863, there was a group of prospectors, about 30 or so prospectors, who, who set off into the Owyhee Mountains out here south of us. Uh, supposedly, they were going to search for the Blue Bucket Mine, if you've heard of the legends of this. Uh, I don't know if they were really focused on that idea of finding the lost mine, but it's more likely that they were out there doing what prospectors do, prospecting, looking for color. And in this case, it paid off. This group found that there was significant deposits of, of silver uh, along the, the deposits along the, the Jordan Creek there. And they each staked out their claims along the creek and, and began to, to make something of it. Now those placer diggings, the, 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 the loose stuff in the bottom of the creek, that all went pretty quickly. But ore deposits on War Eagle Mountain, they were assayed with a higher silver content than that famous Comstock load in Nevada that everybody knows about. They hauled uh, the equipment up for a water-powered stamp mill in 1864 at the, the incredible, inconceivable cost at the time of $70,000. But within 45 days, they'd recoup that and more. They'd made over 90000 in that period of time. And soon, Silver City became one of the largest towns in Idaho, one of the most influential communities. They were the, the first to have a daily newspaper. They were the first to have the telegraph line coming in. This was before Idaho was even a state. Millions of dollars in silver were transported by the Wells Fargo Company out of the mountains and onto the territorial capital in Boise. Miners in town went to war with each other. Guns were drawn, shots were fired over mine shafts that would encroach on another person's claim underground. This is what they fought over. And it was all over a bunch of shiny rocks. Silver, it's a useful metal. It's one of the most conductive of the elements. It resists oxidation and corrosion. And so it gets used in electronics quite frequently. 
It's also antimicrobial and, and non-toxic, and so it has medical applications as well. It's used in deodorants, in batteries, in stained glass, in 3D printing. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, for use in water, for water purification systems, laundry detergent, wood preservative, even sprinkling it on foods as a garnish. So it has a lot of applications. But silver, as we know, is primarily understood as a precious metal. It's primarily used in coins and jewelry and art. The ancient Romans, they prized silver for its luster. They worked it into ornamental plate and, and utensils. It was obviously the preferred medium of exchange in the time, in the marketplace. That standard Roman currency that we read about in the Bible over and over, the, the denarius, that was silver, a silver coin that was worth somewhere between a day's and a week's wages. And as our story from Luke indicates, silver was also used in the production of idols. Now, as of this last Friday, a couple days ago, silver was running about $31 an ounce. Uh, for a, a brief moment, back in 1980, it had reached as high as almost $150 an ounce. It was quite a spike. If you go back to 1931, it was less than $6 an ounce. Now, during Silver City's heyday, when things were really hopping up in the mountains, the price of silver, the federal government held it at $1.29 at an ounce, and it stayed that way for many years. That's volatility. That's things moving up and down, and the volatility of it, it's related to this idea of value, what things are worth. Some basic economics here for you. Is something valuable because of its utility? Or is something valuable because we simply decide that it's valuable? And think about that one. The idea of what they call use value. That's the value of something based on what it can be used for. Uh, probably the most valuable stuff on earth based on use valuable is, is things like water and air. You kind of need those if you're going to live. They're extremely valuable, but they're also the kind of things that are not so valuable in terms of exchange. When was the last time you tried to pay your electric bill with water? For some reason, they don't like that, and they don't want that. Exchange value, it's the value of something based on what you're able to trade for it. And in the case of silver, you can trade silver for dollars. Last Friday, $31 if you wanted to for an ounce of it. If you had a time machine, you could go back in time and exchange it for $150 in 1980. Or if you set your time machine too far back, you'd only get a buck thirty. What we pay for it, what we exchange for it. Now, if I haven't completely lost you yet in my journey through all these different topics and ideas, the point that I'm trying to make is that when it comes to something like silver, as useful as it is, its value still has a lot more to do with the value that we give it, what we think it's worth. We, whatever we think it's worth is what it's worth. We'll have Old West shootouts over it whenever it's really valuable. We'll buy low and we'll sell high. We'll make beautiful necklaces and teapots with it, the things that we'll pass down from generation to generation. And as we see from the story from Acts, the story of Demetrius, we'll create whole industries, guilds of silversmiths who will produce items of silver, specifically idols, because we choose to value it, because we've inherited it, given it some kind of worth. Not because it has worth in and of itself, a use value like water or air, but because we want to see it as valuable. And then when something takes that value away, well, then we have a tendency to get pretty upset. This is the basic gist of the story that we've read. If you remember from last week, we, we had this, this story of the sons of Sceva, this, these so-called exorcists who thought that they could use the name of Jesus as some kind of a magical spell. And I don't want you to miss this part of the story. 
the, 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 there was a decidedly economic flavor to what Luke tells us in that account. The sons of Sceva probably, they were exorcists for hire. There was probably some kind of exchange, some kind of fee that was, that was paid. And, and all the books of magic at the end of that story, all the books that were, that were gathered together and burned by the believers and destroyed. Well, Luke is very careful to tell us right up front, these things have a monetary value. 50,000 silver coins. Now there's a, a brief bit of stage directions going on in Luke's story next. Uh, he tells us that Paul is led by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem eventually. He sends some of his team back over to Macedonia and Achaia. He himself stays there in Asia, in Ephesus. And this is where the conflict begins. This is where the conflict boils up. And it's got the same economic component to it. So Demetrius and his buddies, uh, the, the, all the silversmiths, who'd been making a pretty good living crafting these little idols and shrine pieces that are used in the worship of Artemis, they're pretty ticked about this whole situation. They're upset that Paul's been going out and influencing people to get rid of what they had produced and what they had sold and what their, their livelihood was based on. If you remember Ephesus, this, the city of Ephesus, it's the center of the Artemis cult. It is the place where the big temple is. There's a major temple to Artemis there. And so it's a hub of both the, the rituals and the pagan practices that surround this idea of, of Artemis, but also it's the center of industry that supports and revolves around that cult. Just like you go to Dearborn, Michigan, and there's a big Ford plant there that, that's making Ford pickup trucks. There's all kinds of little peripheral satellite industries that are there to support that big thing. The Artemis Temple had whole constellations of commerce that had formed around it. And all of this is built on a foundation of value. The value that the people had given to Artemis. See, they'd perceived this this Roman goddess as worthy of their worship. And they thought that, they, well, I'm going to get something in exchange if I'm faithful in my worship. And so they're willing to invest not only in the big show, the big temple practices, but in all those associated accessories, the things that guys like Demetrius would create, which worked out really well for Demetrius and his cronies right up until the good news comes in and punctures and deflates all of that perception of value that they'd so carefully created. You read this passage, and it's, it's easy to see it as a passage about idolatry. And it is. It is a passage about idolatry. These little tchotchkes and things that Demetrius is making, absolutely, these are idols in the most classic sense of the word. Little graven images. Now, I'm not an expert on idol worship in the Roman period, but I think what we're talking about here is uh, those little household shrines, they called them lararians, that would be established in any observant home in a particular place, a public part in the, in the household. In addition to the, the big image in the temple down the street, they believed that that temple had the, the statue of Artemis had descended from heaven magically somehow. That's, that's the story as they told it. But in addition to that, you could at home, Offer some devotion, burn a little incense right there in your own personal alcove, a little niche that you, that you had these little local, regional, imperial gods, goddesses set up there. And, and for most good Ephesians, because of where they lived, there was probably a nice little silver statue of Artemis, maybe with crafted by Demetrius on the bottom, set on the shelf. And so Demetrius and this guild of silversmiths they are certainly participating in what we would understand as, yeah, classic idol worship. Graven images, exactly what you would think of. I don't really know or care what their personal convictions are about this. They're in the mix, fueling this practice by providing the images, the representations crafted as an object of devotion and worship. So that's there in the text but don't miss what Luke is doing as well. Luke includes, again, this very strong economic element in the story. 
Now, the fact that these products that Demetrius is producing, the fact that they are used in pagan rituals, is, that's kind of added in as an afterthought almost. From the very beginning of the story, from the very first lines, this all, all this has to do, is, it has to do with money and the making of money, the disturbance concerning the way it revolves around the loss of income. Now, all this rhetoric that Demetrius uses to get his buddies riled up, well, Primarily, it's all about declining wealth, declining revenue that's caused by the gospel. He's hot about the fact that the people are starting to wonder about his little idols and their actual value. Paul's been going around telling people that they have no worth. And doggone it, people are starting to believe it. They're starting to accept it. The exchange value of his work, the amount of money that could be traded for the idols that he produces, well, that's starting to shift. It's starting to decrease. It's not in his favor. This is not going a good direction. If Demetrius were really concerned about the integrity of his patron goddess, well, he probably would have been a little more upset about that, about the reputation of Artemis and not his own pocketbook. But look at what he leads with. Look at what is the most concerning to him. He just seems to tack all that religious stuff onto the end. Oh, and by the way, our great goddess Artemis also might be scorned and, and, and deprived of her majesty. It's not his primary concern. Now Luke goes on in the next verses, the part that we didn't read, he talks about the way that the riot uh, kind of plays out. And it looks like Demetrius manages to whip up the whole crowd, the whole, fo oh, the whole community in, in Ephesus, into some kind of a religious fervor, and they run around town shouting, Great is Artemis! And the whole city is filled with confusion, and there's a lot of, of, uh, of uncertainty. Eventually, though, it does fizzle out, as most of these riots do. Cooler heads on the city council believe this is a fuss over nothing. But, ironically, perhaps, Demetrius in this case, is absolutely correct. His accusations, his concerns, 100% on the mark. Absolutely right. There is no bigger threat to false gods and idols of the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no bigger threat. And so even though they, they don't really know it, Demetrius is seeing things a lot more clearly than these folks that are leading the city see them. But what kind of catches my attention here, what I think perhaps the Spirit has for us today, it has a little more to do with the way that Demetrius illustrates our often contorted values. Yeah, it is a passage about the emptiness of false gods, about idolatry. That is very clearly the center of this. But before we run off and think that because we are somehow beyond the silver statues of Artemis, the household lorariums that they have in, in Ephesus, the shrines, we need to remember that silver idols are just as prevalent today as they were then. It's just that the shape of the silver has changed. Now, Rome practiced a, a pretty simple market economy, the whole empire. The fact that there were these big cities like Rome and Alexandria and Ephesus, it proves that they'd moved beyond a simple living off the land, agrarian, homesteady kind of, of living. They were able to, out in the countryside, produce enough food that they could bring it into the cities so that there'd be food for the, the folks in the, the urban dwellers. And these folks in the cities could specialize in the trades, the, the vocations, things like merchants or lawyers or fishermen or builders or silversmiths. Now in a market economy, people exchange what they have for what they want. That's the simplest way to put it. That's the market. If you have skills as a tent maker, say, you can take the raw resources and, and stitch it together with your craft and, and then make it into something useful and then you can sell that and use the proceeds that you make to, to buy the things that you need, things like food and clothing and shelter for yourself. And if people take what you have made and they see it as highly valuable, you can ask a pretty high price. Top quality stuff here. 
That's supply and demand, folks. Very simple, very basic, the freest sort of market economy. Because people need food. The farmer can come in and ask a certain price for his crops, and then he can use that money to buy what he needs things he can't produce himself. A baker can take that grain and grind it into flour and make bread out of it, and he can add some value to that resource, and he can ask a little more for it. And if you could go even further, if you could market your product, if you could somehow convince people that your products had a value beyond what they were used for, maybe by adding a little religious significance to them, you can charge a premium. But what happens when people start to question the value of that added significance? What happens when people start to wonder if maybe, hey, this doesn't have the value we thought it had? Well, the market falls apart. The bottom drops out. No more demand. There's no need for a supply. Now, I know I'm hitting this economic angle pretty hard this morning simply because I think it's exactly what Luke is doing. I mean, Luke just keeps going back to this stuff. He's not really, if you notice this, he's not really caught up in condemning the worship of Artemis, is he? It's not really his concern. Because he knows that it's meaningless. He knows that it's empty. He knows what Paul knows. He knows what Paul has been preaching all along, that gods made by hands are not gods at all. Read that passage from Isaiah again, Isaiah 44. It's so funny. You need to read that. It's great stuff. So these are not gods. And I I hope you caught this in the text. Demetrius understood that. He got Paul exactly right. He said it. Men, you all know that we get our wealth from this business. You all also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. We can't beat up on Demetrius too much. He's one of the few people that actually does get it. He's one of the only Ephesians in the story that really understands what's going on. So at least these three guys are in on the truth. Paul, who's preaching the message, Demetrius, who sees it clearly, and Luke, who writes it down. Gods made with hands really are no gods at all. That's settled. That's accepted. And so Luke's not really interested in combating this false god of Artemis. He's not really interested in combating the idols. He's more interested in combating another kind of silver idol. These pagan practices that we see in the text, it's a little bit of a smokescreen kind of obscures things from our, our vision a little bit. It's, a, it's almost a distraction. Demetrius, he wants to play on that. He wants to get people riled up about the supposed desecration of Artemis, but it's not really Artemis that's being threatened here. He's got an ulterior motive to all of his rabble-rousing, and it begins and ends with his pocketbook. And if we get caught up in paying too much attention to that exotic pagan practices, the weirdness of uh, what we think of as idol worship, chuckling at these naive superstitions, well, we're not really any better than the rioting crowd. We're missing the point too. Because this whole thing really isn't about the worship of Artemis. It's about the loss of power experienced by Demetrius and his guild. They are decreasing It's about the declining value of what they bring to the table, their investments. Now, it doesn't look like Demetrius was open to Jesus in any way at all. So for Demetrius, the hierarchy in his heart, in his mind, the way of Jesus, way down here, kind of an an irritant, the worship of Artemis, yeah, that's my bread and butter. But, you know, the most important thing, it's my bank account. It's my trade. It's my way of making a living, making a good living, having influence, getting rich. His business and his wealth were his greatest priority, his object of devotion. It was his wallet that was his worship. And to be fair, it probably wasn't about money for the sake of money. 
There are people that, that do that, but I don't know if that's the case here. He probably valued money for the influence it gave him. Because that's pretty common. That's a, that's a human tendency. We don't really want the money. We want the influence that money brings, the power over situations and circumstances. And then what gives us power, well, that becomes our idol. So Demetrius comes up with this story, an alternative narrative, saying, Paul, Paul is threatening the dignity and the majesty of Artemis. He's attacking our way of life. But the idol that Demetrius really seems to be worshiping is a lot more mundane, a lot more familiar, perhaps. His complaint about the declining influence of Artemis actually hit his real concern, his declining fortunes. But like we said, Demetrius was hitting a lot closer to the truth than maybe he realized, because this is the truth. The good news about Jesus absolutely does this. The good news about Jesus does exactly what Demetrius saw it doing. Coming in, attacking these false ways, these false idols, these ways of the world. So regardless of what idol we happen to worship, Jesus is in the business of knocking them over, tearing them down, getting rid of them, whatever they are. It doesn't matter if our silver is shaped like the statue of the goddess of the hunt, Artemis, or if our silver is fashioned into something else, like stocks or bonds or savings accounts or even that shiny silver coin. Silver is silver. And it only has the value that we give it. So if we want to value something that really is valuable, something with eternal worth, then I think we need to see our silver for what it is, some shiny rocks. Like Jesus himself says, no one can serve two masters. We don't get a whole pantheon of gods to worship. We can only worship one. And even though we have a history of loving <laughs> these things, of even fighting over these things, even shooting the place up because of them, silver, it's no God worth worshiping. I think that's true regardless of the shape it takes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we get distracted by this world, all these things that this culture around us, all the things that it says are important and that we need to chase after them. We know that in the end it is just, it's just idolatry. Because it is way too easy for us, Lord, to put something in front of you to say something is more important, to value it, to cherish it, maybe even to worship it. Lord, help us to understand that idolatry isn't something that has been lost to history. It's not just about little statues and shrine goods that it takes many forms. Lord, you have put us in this material world and you have given us the opportunity to do good things with this material wealth that you've given us, whether it's small or large. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to hold it all loosely so that we may hold tightly to you. Lord, only you are worthy of our worship. Help us to see that and to live it. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.
Please stand. Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our lives, loud, restless sea. Day by day, his sweet voice sounded, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden storm, from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in cares and pleasures, still he Christian, many more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercies, Savior, So Paul and Gil are a little too gracious to be too forward, but I'll do it. Give to Mission Aviation Fellowship. If you have some of that extra silver that is needing to find a good home, it could not find a better one than that. So I want to encourage you to, to pray and think about that. And do be praying for their work. So I just wanted to remind you of that. If you would, bow with me. Lord, you do call us over all the tumult and all the cares of this world. You call us to leave behind this empty promise that the world gives us as, as shiny as it is. And you say, follow me. And so, Lord, we will follow you out into this world. We will be faithful in what you call us to do. We will show love to those that need it. Lord, we pray for those that aren't with us today. We ask that you would bless them, keep them safe. And Lord, again, we pray that you would gather us together so that we can praise and worship you. For you are worthy of our praise. And all this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may go in peace.